Hello and welcome to our series called Exiles. My name is Walter Martinez and I'm excited that you're going on this expedition with us through 1 Peter. Now, today I'm going to do something slightly different. Usually I go through the verses of the Bible and we go through each thing synonymously and it seems to be going really well, but today I'm going to do something, I'm going to do more of an introduction, if you will, which is why it's so important for you to be able to go to our website, centralsda.church, go to prayer meeting, the section there, and download the handout. I'm going to need your help. In order to do this part that I'm going to do that's slightly different, you're going to do some of the heavy lifting later on on your own. See, I've created a document, has a list of questions, an outline, a space for notes. It's really worth your while to go uh, check it out. Again, it's at centralsda.church prayer dash meeting and you can find all of that there now if you're live in central or you're live at choctaw we have the handouts all provided for you so no worries there let me just restate myself for a second tonight i'm going to introduce first peter chapter two but you're going to be responsible for going over the bible verses that are you know go with the questions and the discussion uh, in the handout Take some time, look over the handout, let God guide you toward what he's wanting you to learn, to apply, uh, and to get started in your own life. Cool? All right. Well, before we begin, I want to have a word of prayer, and we'll dive in. Let's pray. God in heaven, thanks for the privilege of being able to study your word. Thank you for the letter uh, called 1 Peter. Thank you for how it impacts us today in our world, though we live thousands of years later. I pray that you'd be with our minds and our hearts as we take some time to reflect, to study, and then to pray. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Behind me, you're going to see some words, and each week we're going to be adding to this list of words. Um, These words have value. They have value because we've looked at the scriptures that have given them meaning. They have lessons behind them. For example, salvation. Salvation is a big theme for Peter. He saw Jesus die and he saw him resurrect, which was a phenomenal thing for him. He couldn't stop talking about it. Salvation is key to Peter. Jesus came. He died, yes, but he rose again to give us eternal life. Now, you can look behind me. And we also have the word holy, but I should say hope. Hope comes first. Hope is another key element for Peter. Uh, For the exiles, this life on earth is not the only life that there is. Peter has helped us see that there's something much better waiting in store for us. We look forward to, or we have a hope and expectation in the second coming of Jesus. And then the last word, holy. Last week we talked about holy living. And the importance of holy living. And, and you might ask the question, well, why, why is holy living such an important thing? Or why should we live a holy life? Well, that's, that, that was the topic of last week. And the great thing is we're recording all of these sessions. So if you want to go and look at one that we've done previously, just go to centralsda.church and uh, go to prayer meeting. And you'll be able to scroll down and see the previous ones along with the handouts that go with them. So, having said all of that, I do want to emphasize the fact that words are important. Peter chooses his words carefully, and today we do have a special word for you, and that word is the word stone. I know, it doesn't seem like a big deal. You can find stones Uh, On the street, you can find stones along a dirt path. Ethan loves to collect stones. So what's the big deal about the word stone? It doesn't seem like much. But watch. Listen. Uh, I want to take you back to an Old Testament story. A time in which uh, a lot of prophetic things were taking place. Uh, Back to a time when an exile... um, was used by God to stir up the then known world and to, in many ways, stir up our lives today too as we look back 
and how God used this exile to even impact us today. That's the kind of effects that he had. Uh, I'm thinking of, of this particular time period in which a king went to bed one night and he had a horrific night. Uh, he woke up startled by this dream and he could not remember what this dream was. Some of you are already jumping there. You already know where I'm going with this. And, and so, so he calls on his wise men to come and tell him his dream. And they would like him to do the same thing so that they can interpret his dream. But anyways, long story short, um, they can't do it. And the king gets really mad. So this exile finds out. And he goes and talks to the king. And God reveals after prayer and after time of, of just you know fasting and praying, God reveals to this young exile Daniel the not only the interpretation but the dream itself so i want to take you back to a book called daniel and we're looking at daniel 2 verse 34 so here we go i'm switching back to the bible reading from the new king james version in verse 34 there's this section that speaks specifically about a stone so keep this in mind verse 34 You watched while a stone was cut out with hands, which stuck, I'm sorry, cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together. It became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. Here's the key word. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Filled the whole earth. Now, there's five things that I'd like to point out about this stone in this particular story. Number one, it's cut out, meaning it came from somewhere, right? But number two, it wasn't cut out with human hands which means that it wasn't cut out by something earthly or even by humans here on earth. Number three, it struck the feet of this incredible statue, right? And the statue, as you read through Daniel 2, um, represented kingdom after kingdom after kingdom. And, And so this stone hits the base of the statue, causing it to crumble and crash and just become like, Fine particles that are blown away by the wind. This is that stone that then, uh, after it cra- you know, brings the statue down to its knees, so to speak, just completely demolishes it. it, it becomes a huge mountain that fills the entire earth. And I can just imagine Daniel, ex- like not explaining, but reminding the king of his dream. And the look on the king's face, because he's been agitated, nobody's been able to tell him his dream. He knows that it's important. And as he watches Daniel, and as he listens to Daniel, it's like a light bulb turns on and he starts remembering all the things that he had seen in his dream. And he he imagines that stone and he imagines that mountain. And now comes the interpretation, which is really cool. So let's continue. Going back to Daniel chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 44. Verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom, okay, get that, shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45, inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So it says that this stone is a kingdom, right? Well, I mean, all of the other items in this statue are kingdoms, so... But actually, the Bible says something different. It says God will set up his kingdom. 
That's important because what we're seeing here is that it's not human. It's divine. Okay? I told you, this is an introduction to what Peter is going to be talking about tonight. You're going to have to go and study the verses in 1 Peter chapter 2, this section that you have in your handout with the questions. But I'm just setting it up. Right? This is, it's so fascinating. Okay, So this is just one portion of the introduction. And so far we've heard from Daniel's story, the dream that he interpreted. This stone is a kingdom. It's divine but I want to shift gears for a moment, and I want to travel to Isaiah chapter 28. So let me go ahead and put this in, in our digital Bible here. Um, Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28. We're going to look at verse 16. So here we go. Therefore, thus says the Lord God. This is Isaiah 28, 16. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Laid in Zion a costly, precious cornerstone. That's what we just read. And it's laid in Zion. Now, Zion is a title, a title given to none other than a kingdom, a kingdom in which God's kingdom uh, exists, where he reigns as king above all. This stone is a cornerstone to a particular building. But what building? Um, for that, we're going to have to continue our search for this significance with this word stone. See, this is fascinating. I mean, this is, I love how scripture works. You can start in one section and jump all the way to a totally different section, but they're connected, they're interrelated, and the more that you study, the more that you learn, the more that you begin to see how the nuances of all of this bring about something much, much more special, something more, um, I mean, it's enough to just blow your mind. So in the first section, we looked at how the stone represented a kingdom. In this second section, where we're looking at Isaiah, we find that it's dealing with a building or a structure. And um, to understand more, now we have to journey to another section of Scripture called the Psalms. I'm going to go ahead and put this in. It's Psalm chapter 118. Psalm 118, verse 22. All right, here we go. Here's what David writes. He wrote this psalm. Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So David writes that this cornerstone um, wasn't always looked at in, in good light, so to speak. The builders themselves rejected it cast it aside, didn't want to use it, and then turn around and have to end up using it as not just any old piece of the structure, but the actual cornerstone. So you might be asking, well, what's so special about a cornerstone? Well, a cornerstone is a foundational piece of a building. It's actually what forms the base of a corner with two uh, joining walls, so it pretty much keeps the entire structure up. And uh, here's where it actually begins to get interesting. Okay, hopefully you've been tracking so far. I mean, you might be wondering what any of this has to do with the lesson. Bear with me. Come on, humor me. Hang with me a little bit longer because this is where it starts to get really cool. Now, in Jewish rabbinic thought, there's a tradition of a story that goes like this. And I'm, I'm going to read it because I don't want to botch it. So here we go. When Solomon's temple was being built... It was forbidden for the sound of hammers to be heard at the job site because it was too holy of a place. It was their place of worship. So they couldn't have worship with construction going on in the background, right? I mean, that's, that's just super distracting. So it had to be very quiet. What this meant for the construction was that each and every 20-ton stone had to have a shop drawing and, well, 
It was made in a quarry several miles away. Following so far? Special place. Needed to be quiet for them to worship. They're building the, the pieces at a totally different place, right? Cutting the stone. So several miles away, each stone was carefully cut for its exact spot in the temple. From the very start, there was a plan for each stone. The very first stone to be delivered was the capstone. But that's the last stone needed in the construction. Okay? So the builder said, what's this? This doesn't look like any of the first stones we need. Put it over there for now. Push it aside, right? Rejected it. Well, years went by and the grass grew over the capstone and everyone generally forgot about that first stone. Finally, the construction was done and the builder said, send us the capstone. And the word came back from the quarry, we already sent it. And they were super confused, obviously. Then someone remembered what they had done with the very first stone sent to them. It was taken from its lowly position among the overgrown weeds and dirt and so forth, where it had become forgotten, and it was honored in the final ceremony to complete, get this, the temple. Thus the scripture says, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or the capstone. Pretty cool story, right? If anything else, it makes for a nice story. A literal stone is rejected. But in order to complete the temple, they had to go back, find it, bring back what they had rejected, and place it where it belonged. I want you to catch the significance of that. Okay, just, you know, you're trekking with me. Hopefully you're still trekking with me. Um, the building that was being built was a place of worship. A temple. Now, that's super significant. But there's another interpretation as well, as often is with different teachers. They come up with different interpretations to give, you know, a different perspective on a particular subject. And this subject of the cornerstone of the stone um, had a couple of perspectives. Here's the second one. Rabbis believed that King David, who wrote this psalm, was referring to none other than himself. That once upon a time, when Samuel went in search for a replacement for King Saul, he looked at all of David's brothers, right? And God said, nope, 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 nope. And Samuel had to ask Jesse, do you have any other boys? And the boy that Jesse had rejected, the boy who was out in the field, the one who was out with the sheep, is called to come before Samuel. And God says, there's the one. So which is it? Is it the temple story or is it the story of a king, the one true king, right? I think it's so, so powerful because David's writing, they say he was writing about himself. And I don't know, I, as, I, as I hear both stories, it begins to kind of give me chills, kind of gives me goosebumps because we started this whole thing by saying there's a significant word, a valuable word that we're going to be talking about today. And that word is stone like i said earlier stones are the things that you can just pick up off the road stuff that my son collects and he has lots of little rocks and stones in his collection what could possibly be so significant about a stone and yet you know even if we were to stop at this point which i'm going to pause here just for a moment we can see that a stone has significant um, symbolism, even if it's if we just took one of the things we've talked about, but we've talked about three different things. Here we go. In the Hebrew mindset, this stone from the Old Testament could refer to a kingdom, in this case, divine, because it wasn't cut out from human hand, a temple or a holy place, a structure dedicated to God. Or it could be a person, a king, a true king. This is where it gets, this is, this is where it gets really crazy. Um, if you've had a hard time following this whole time, as we've been looking at different Bible texts on how they relate to a stone, I'd love, even if you forgot everything else, for you to just zero in on this last part 
because this is what this is what gives me chills, what helps me to just recognize how powerful Scripture is. You see, in the Hebrew mindset, the stone was either a kingdom, it was either a temple, or it was the Messiah, the, the future you know, king that they were looking forward to. But then along comes Jesus. I'm telling you, this is awesome. Along comes Jesus, and in Luke chapter 20, I'm going to go ahead and punch that in here. In Luke chapter 20, we find Jesus is coming up to the end of his ministry, and he launches into this parable. I'm just going to put it on the screen here. I'm going to change the translation. You can use the translation you're most comfortable with. I'm going to change it to the voice just to be able to give it a little bit of um, difference here. And Jesus tells the story of a vineyard. And in this vineyard, there's a man who owns the vineyard, but there are tenants who work there. And the tenants who work there have this agenda that they want to take over the land. They want the vineyard. So when the landowner sends one of his servants, they beat him up and send him back. They send another servant, beat him up, send him back. Then the landowner decides to send his own son, thinking... Of course, they'll listen to him. It's my son, right? But when his son gets there, the um, vineyard workers, the tenants, they not only beat up the son, but they kill the son because they believe that they will now be able to inherit the land. And as the story goes on, um, you know, the crowd is basically in, in shock and despair. And then Jesus, here we go, verse 17, then Jesus says this, Why then do the Hebrew scriptures contain these words? The stone that the builders rejected has become the very stone that holds together the entire foundation. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to fragments. And if that stone falls on anyone, he will be ground to dust. Why is this significant? Why did Jesus talk about this? He's coming to the place in his ministry where he knows he's about to die. He knows the agenda that the religious leaders have had. And very much like the story in the parable, they have, throughout the ages, God's people have destroyed the people that God has sent to them to warn them, to turn their eyes away from the things that their eyes were on, focus them back on him. And time and time again, they killed the prophets, they killed the messengers, they wanted nothing to do with God. So God chooses to send His one and only Son, and He sends His Son as a human being, divine but human. And what is happening? Look at verse 19. That was the last straw for the religious scholars and the chief priests. They were ready to attack Him right then and there. But they couldn't for fear of the public opinion. And they realized that Jesus, through this parable, had exposed their violent intentions. Jesus had exposed their violent intentions. In other words, they knew that Jesus knew that they wanted him dead. Do you know the way that they should have killed Jesus for the supposed blasphemy that Jesus was committing? Some of you are are probably putting two and two together. They were supposed to stone him, literally pick up stones, throw them at Jesus until Jesus was dead. Now we know that that's not how they killed him. But I can't, I can't not see the fact that there's significance in that. What they didn't realize was that they were fulfilling prophecy. But how in the world did they get to this point? How were they so blind that they couldn't see that Jesus was the embodiment of all of those scriptures leading to this point? Before we cast the first stone, so to speak, before we pass judgment on these religious leaders, I think it's important to just pause for a moment and see if we might be able to put ourselves in their shoes. Here's the thing. 
Their eyes were in all the wrong places. They wanted a kingdom, or they wanted a holy temple, or they wanted a coming Messiah, but they wanted it their way, on their terms, not with any kind of divine intervention. Church, the reason these religious scholars missed it was because their eyes were planted on things that they shouldn't have been on. And this is the reason why tonight's study is so powerful and so important for us. Because Peter wants us to realize and to recognize that as exiles, our eyes need to be placed on something so much more significant than what you see around you in the world today. Sure, the things that you see, sure, the things that are going on are They're monumental, and they have their significance, but they're not the most important thing in your life. They shouldn't be. When you turn on the news, or when you turn on Facebook, when you go to social media, or all these other places, or all these other outlets, or all these other conversations that you might have, please remember that those things are not what's most important. What's most important should always be God. And that's what Peter is harping at. Here's the thing. As exiles, our eyes need to be planted on what matters most. As exiles, listen to this. We come to Jesus, not to some special kingdom, if you will. Not some special nation, if you will. Not some special place on earth. We come to Jesus, the one who is the living stone. We come to Jesus, not a place of worship, not a temple, not a building, but the one who is our holy place. And we come to Jesus, Peter writes this, and you're going to get a chance to study this in just a moment. We come to Jesus, not an earthly king, not an earthly ruler or person in charge, but our one true king get this church and in turn i mean this is what blows my mind and in turn with our eyes focused on him he makes us get this church he makes us living stones which takes us right back to the beginning what's what's the significance of the stone well when you come to the living stone when you come to jesus you suddenly become part of this structure that he is building, of this kingdom that he is erecting, of this of this beautiful movement that he has started. And he can't finish it or he can't accomplish it without your help. Granted, you could say, Pastor Walter, of course he can, but he chooses, let's put it this way, he chooses not to. Instead, he chooses to have you be a part of the process. That's why Peter's going to write that we are a holy people. We are living stones. We are a holy temple that is being erected. As exiles, however, our eyes have to ever always be on Jesus. What's the significance of a stone? It's everything. It's the foundation on which everything else is built. And I love that what Peter has just introduced to us, just with these words, living stone, is the fact that on this, everything else either makes it or breaks it. When you come to Jesus, either your heart will be broken and you will fall in love with him and become part of this movement that he has, or your entire life will fall apart. Everything that you see around you in this world isn't all that there is. When you come to Jesus, (laughs) you know, when your day of reckoning comes, right? Either you begin to live life, you know, forever or life is over. And really, what was it on earth? Just a speck in the grand scheme of eternity. So may you, as you go into your time of study this evening, recognize that as an exile, things might not always make sense. 
May you know in your heart that this is not your true home. But may you also begin to learn and to recognize what it means to be part of a greater picture that God has. One that started long before we were ever born, but continues right through where we are today in this earth's history. That we can become living stones just like Jesus was, giving hope, giving salvation through, through the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We can point people back to Jesus, but you and I as exiles must come to him. So may you learn what it means to continually come to him, to continually be a living stone for him. As you break into your time of discussion, or as if you turn off, off the internet for now and you go to your Bible, may you be blessed in this study of 1 Peter, the beginning of chapter 2. See you next time. Thank you.